If I said that in today's conversation, our guest is a classical singer who has performed in Carnegie Hall and in choirs for singers such as Cecilia Bartoli and Luciana Pavarotti, you might think that's a change of tune for the Money Maze podcast. If I said that he is a British financial commentator and author who spent almost three decades reporting at the Financial Times, including being global head of the Lex column, before moving to Bloomberg as senior markets editor, you might know I'm talking to John Authors. So John, welcome to the Money Maze podcast. Thank you very much for that very kind uh... Very kind introduction. I'm very, very glad to be here. I've followed you. I've read you for as many years, uh, well, as I can count or recall. Um, and so you've been a, you've actually been a centerpiece of lots of people in the markets for such a long time. You, I mean, you know, the word iconic might be overused, but you are, you know, you've been with us on the journey um, as we try and make sense of of some stuff we're going to discuss today. But very serious question. When you were at Oxford, I read that you were captain of your college university challenge team that earned the record for the highest score in any round of the competition with 520 points. And then you lost in the final. How did you feel? (laughs) Going straight to a weak point. Um, Well, well, I I think in hindsight, going back over the years, the, uh, the, uh, the record was just so glorious and such a ridiculous one-off freak occurrence, um, you know, like Bob Beeman's long jump record. We, we, we scored 520 and the previous record was 425. But to some extent, it, it did help that, you know, the opposition were very dis- disheartened by the, uh, by the rehearsal and went to the Granada bar in between. I can live with it. It's, a very, it's one of my very happy memories um, of, a, of when I was younger and there is something even more ludicrously emphatic um, about having scored the highest score ever than there would have been if we'd actually won the tournament. So I, I, it's, it's something I can happily live with. Certainly in the UK, it is generally regarded, you know, this was whatever it was, 36 years ago now, um, that those 25 minutes when we were always first on the buzzer and the other guys were giving up, still count for more than anything I've done since in the eyes of most people in the UK. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, look, you went from Oxford, you did a master's in journalism at Columbia Journalism School. You have an MBA from Columbia Business School. Um, And I guess the first question that really sort of got me as I looked at your history is why financial journalism? That's an interesting one. Journalism, because I got ever more of, of a bug for curiosity. Uh, financial journalism, to be honest, because it was the FT that felt the desire to, to, uh, to give me a job, to, uh, to, uh, to take a chance on me. Um, so I'm actually, I, I did philosophy, politics, and economics. So I, yeah, so I certainly did have some training in economics. I was much more interested at that point in politics I spent time, I, my first breakthrough into, into journalism was actually with the Daily Telegraph on American politics. I had spent time uh, at a, an, an organization called Congressional Quarterly, which I think has now been subsumed into something else. But I had spent uh, a long summer in Washington phoning up state parties about how they were going to be running their uh, caucuses and primaries the following year. So deep in the dweebs, you know, the, uh, the, the weeds of what was going to happen in American politics. And I managed to parlay that into getting, you know, the, uh, the arrogance of youth, or you, you, you're so young, you don't know what you don't know. I said to the television, can I help out, please? And they said, yes. Journalism was a, was a bug that came on quite early. Um, financial journalism, the FT very kindly decided they wanted to hire me. And since then, it's a glove that has steadily fit better. Uh, And once you begin to get, most people enjoy doing things they're good at. And most people enjoy doing things that others recognize them to be good at, which largely speaking is where I am with uh, what I've been doing as a financial columnist for the last uh, almost 20 years now. Uh, and And so it's come to... It's come to fit better, but I, I didn't. I think it's part of 
one of the things I'm actually quite lucky with when it comes to being a financial columnist is that I didn't set out as being fascinated by markets or terribly excited to try to go away and make money. I still think of myself more as a journalist trying to understand what's going on and explain it rather than uh, somebody who is really fascinated by this and wants to show you how to be, make more money than anyone else. That is interesting. And I think we're going to weave a little bit into the journalism and a little bit into the markets here because you sit firmly, squarely. People who are professional money managers are consuming your work every day. And, and, and so clearly you've, you've, you've um, validated what you've been doing. But in the 29 years at the FT, if I'm right, you held those positions such as US markets editor, Mexico Bureau city chief, US banking correspondent, 2010 head of the Lex column. As you reflect back, what was the most satisfying piece of work? Possibly, uh, and this surprises people. Well, there are two things. First of all, the crisis. I think I made the joke at the time, one of my favorite quotes is George Harrison apparently once said, if you're going to play guitar in a rock band, it might as well be the Beatles. And uh, at the same time, uh, by the same token, if you're going to be an investment editor, if you're going to be a financial columnist, it might as well be for the Financial Times in New York from 2006 to 2009, during that whole period of the crisis. That was, that was a very great honor in many ways. Um, and you know, it's you want to, to be challenged, and uh, you know I was, and um, it, it feels it still feels very good to have been uh, to have done that, to have had that opportunity, to have taken it. In terms of what was most satisfying, I loved going to Mexico, uh, which was a very unorthodox thing when I did it. I'd already got my MBA, uh, and I'd spent. You know, three years being the banking correspondent and doing doing a lot of stuff in the in the Wall Street at a very exciting time in the dot com bubble, uh, but I was still young enough to to not be in too much of a hurry, and I went off to to Mexico, which was very good for me in terms of having to learn Spanish. But it was fascinating. It's a wonderful country. Um, I got married while I was there. We had our first kid while we were there, so it's obviously you know lots of very positive connections. For me. But the power and the opportunity to make a difference you have as a foreign correspondent in a country where a lot of the domestic correspondents uh, have quite strong limitations on what they can say, and when they really care what the foreign press says about them, that matters a lot. That, that, that was a real sense of uh, being able to do something. And I think the other thing that's interesting, it's, it's very useful to go outside your box occasionally and understand what really makes something tick. Now, the, the anecdote, if there was one thing, one experience that really helped me understand what was going wrong during the great financial crisis and, and, and understand the, you know, the mechanics of what the problem was, when I was in Mexico, they were still just completing their recovery from the big banking crisis. And one big thing the government wanted to do was get more mortgage finance out there so, so that the middle class could actually afford to, to buy houses again. Uh, so they appointed this extremely bright young technocrat with a you know economics doctorate from MIT who spoke English better than I did to set up this, this body uh, and work out how they were going to fund prime the mortgage market. And the basic idea was he was going to go away and work out how to set up a Mexican Fannie Mae. And I spent, you know, I, I interviewed this, this guy, very calm, very clear. And he came back from months of fact-finding in the US and said, the last thing on earth Mexico needs is its own Fannie Mae. And he then explained what the problems were with Fannie Mae in, man, in ways that now seem completely obvious because everything he Everything is worried about things to us. And the other thing that was very interesting, he said, the one thing we do need to do in this country if we're going to get the mortgage market going is we need to get credit insurance. You need to get monoline insurers involved so that it's possible to securitize this at all, so that people outside the, the, uh, the uh, industry are going to be prepared to buy mortgages. And indeed, the monoline insurers in the US had AAA ratings, and when they all went bust early in 2008, that was a very serious 
problem. That was it was Bill Ackman's very famous short for initial short was on the monoline insurance. So anyway, you wouldn't think it, but perhaps the single most revealing moment that guided me through the global financial crisis was talking with a a young bureaucrat try, or technocrat rather trying to uh, trying to rebuild Mexico after its banking crisis. Which makes me make three observations. Number one, Bill Ackman is, we hope, appearing in a couple of months' time, so we're looking forward to that. Number two, I am old enough, and I was on a call yesterday listening to the case for Venezuelan debt and restructurings to remember buying the CETES in 94 when I you know, was just doing a little bit of fiddling around as an investor. Um, and uh, and the third thing, which I we often ask at the end, but I have to ask you right now, is if you were advising a young person as to which geography they should start their journalistic career in finance, where would you tell them to go? I think time in emerging markets. First of all, I have lots of younger, younger, it's one of the more pleasant parts of my job is that, I, you know, they hope, they asked me at Bloomberg and they did at the FT to mentor younger younger journalists, which is a very rewarding, pleasant thing to do. They all think that a year is a long time because they're younger. I think I used to think that too. Telling people you don't need to be in too much of a hurry and to take the opportunity to actually understand an emerging market before moving on. I think uh, a lot of the best journalists I've known, both Bloomberg and the FT, were people who did spend a good solid few years in slightly more funky, out-of-the-way places. China is a very difficult place to cover these days. Latin America, you know, Spanish and Portuguese are that much easier to, to conquer. That's a pretty interesting concept. I think the whole of uh, India, the Indian subcontinent, is, is undercovered um, and seriously fascinating place. But it, it's, it's when you work in places where you can't rely on institutions to work or when those institutions don't exist, but you understand how important they are and you have a better grasp of how things like 2008 happened, how that went as badly wrong as it did. So yes, go to the emerging markets, young man and young woman. Great. So that takes us back. I want to come back to the great financial crisis because in 2010, you published The Fearful Rise of Markets, a short view of global bubbles and synchronized meltdown. And one of your conclusions, which was, of course, related to the Greenspan put that we started, I guess, all the way back in Y2K in 99, it led to artificially high levels of price correlation. And my question is, has anything happened to diminish that? On the specifics of the correlation... Yes, on the on the uh, perverse impact of what you might call the Greenspan put, whatever you want to call it, the uh, the uh, prolonged uh, intervention to keep yields low, um, which was, as it turns out, only in its infancy when I wrote that book. That continues in a very big way. Some of the correlations you see, it's a, a lot of this is to do with the changing role of China, but China no longer can be guaranteed to raise and raise the entire complex of uh, of uh, other emerging markets and of commodities in the way in the way that it once did and you see some very startling carry trading going on at the moment but similarly at one point the lower the vix the lower volatility in the US stock market the, the stronger the brazilian real would be it was a very clear relationship the Hungarian stock market tracked almost perfectly with the Korean. I had a lot of fun finding all these examples back in, back in the day. The extremity of the way the world behaves as one has diminished, I would say. That said, if you look inside individual markets, and particularly stock markets, the growth of passive investing, the growth of ETFs has definitely led to... Um, there is much more need for top-down analysis these days rather than classic flex style looking at companies and working out whether they're too cheap or too expensive. So much is now happening from top-down decisions which are reflected um, through ETFs and can have very extreme, strange effects when they finally reach the level of individual stocks and bonds. 
And before we leave that, would therefore the conclusion that I could take from your observation be that whilst global macro hedge funds have largely been out of favour for 20 years, is that you would want to be, if you're an allocator, thinking, looking, exploring them more? I think you have to be. Um, that said, it's very, very difficult. The ways to actually try to make money to do better than you know a 60-40 portfolio, it, it is very difficult to do that. Even though there are many problems with the 60-40 portfolio, it is very difficult to do that. One is to be a uh, is to have the guts to be a concentrated stock picker. Only buy stocks where you're really, really confident that they're going to go up a lot because everyone else has it wrong. And another, yes, is to really try to uh, to to fly ahead of the macro, work out what you know that others aren't getting uh, about the macro. Um, also, not exactly easy. And um, yeah, I, I guess the same is also true with stocks. Timing is a is a I've learned is a, <laughs> is a very serious is a very serious impediment on either you know both to stock pickers and to macro uh, asset allocators. I'm going to fortunately be able to pose that question to Scott Besant in a few weeks, who, of course, was Soros' CIO. And he has he says he really likes to focus on the one or two big macro trades that could run for a while. So I'm hoping to be enlightened. And if you're George Soros, you have the confidence to do so. It's, it's very few of us actually have the testis, testicular fortitude to, to do the kind of things that George Soros has, has done over the years. So before we get to that 6040, in 2018, you wrote a really good piece, uh, The Investing Lessons from 12 Years of Writing the Long View, and you had some really important takeaways. Can you just summarize them? And also, would you add or subtract any today? I don't think I would subtract any. Um, what I was at the, that was my final long view for the, uh, for the FT. And I looked at how a mutual fund that I had bought with the proceeds of a prize 26 years earlier, being Unit Trust Journalist of the Year, how that had done. And basically, it hadn't done that badly uh, at all. In fact, it had more or less matched the FTSE. And compound interest meant that it was worth a lot of money. The big thing, and I think this is the critical point, is that if I had been more diversified and hadn't focused only on the UK, which I did, I would have made vastly more money because the US, which is not exactly a high risk place to place your money if you're a Brit, did vastly better than the UK did. And so that's one key element is you do need to stay diversified. Another one, I think, is that timing is ultimately close to impossible. So if it's your own money, uh, go with the discipline of rebalancing. Um, you will at least therefore be selling stuff that has recently risen a bit and um, putting more money into stuff that might be relatively cheaper. And that's a good, clear discipline. You're never going to time, you're not going to buy on March the 9th, 2009, or you're not, you're not going to take all your money out of cash and put them into stocks just when the S&P hits 666. That's just not going to happen. Um, if you continue to do dollar cost averaging, if you continue to rebase every three months or so, you're along the way, you're going to buy some stuff cheaper. And that's about as much as you can hope for. I, I also think that uh, in line with what I was just saying, markets aren't efficient, but they're efficient enough that it's almost impossible for a human being to be confident they can beat the market. Um, so I do think, despite all the problems I'm concerned about with passive investing, you have to put passive investing, passive investments at the core of any portfolio. Another point that I will admit that I have probably over the course of my been career, my career been too bearish. I don't necessarily mind that too much in that there are plenty of people out there with the, talking to my readers who have an incentive to be too bullish. Um, but I do think perhaps I should have um, a health warning at the end of column saying, remember, it's always risky to be out of the market. You should be in stocks most of the time. So I'm not saying that that, that doesn't mean that uh, I'm comfortable with the kind of hype that a lot of other people get. But there is a risk 
involved an opportunity cost involved in not being in the stock market. And even when I'm being fairly negative about the stock market, I don't think you should be out altogether. That even in 2008, if you kept some money in, at least it was there when, when it hit bottom. I suppose the final thing that from, from what I wrote then, which I, I certainly still agree with, is that many things are more important in life than finance. And very few of us can not worry about money at all, um, such as life. But you can automate, you can just give yourself a clear enough structure uh, and get it working following some fairly straightforward rules so that you worry about money that much less and get on to enjoy the things in life that are truly enjoyable. Um, so I, I've had a fascinating time writing about the markets the last 15, 20 years, um, you know, compared to the, the, the various good times that have come along, bringing up kids and so on, it's nothing. That's, that's what matters. So that leads us to the 60, 40, 60 equity, 40 debts, cornerstones of long-term portfolios. Then we move into an extraordinary era that none of us of a certain age could have predicted where super cheap money becomes the norm and alternatives and the industry surrounding it mushroom. And we had, I had a question from a, Hugo, a gentleman called Hugo Cable Cure who works at Rothschilds in London. And he said, can you make the case that certain alternatives can replicate the risk-adjusted returns of bonds despite their illiquidity? I have friends who've made exactly that case um, and have been for a while. I mean, there, there, there's the idea that um, hedge funds, you can just take a look at you know, the standard deviation. The, you, you, you can work out how volatile they are and what their returns are, what they're correlated with, and then you can just buy futures to mimic even you know, George Soros' quantum, quantum plan. Uh, in terms of liquidity, mimicking what you can do with a 60-40, one of the people who most impressed me uh, that I've come across, uh, that I've been lucky enough to meet, uh, was David Swenson, who ran the uh, Yale Endowment for many years and uh, passed away from cancer last year, very sadly. Um, and I think he's a genius in many ways. And his genius was to spot the opportunities of investing in illiquid assets to um, the, the you, if efficient public markets are difficult to beat, inefficient ones you can beat. So he has asset, he has Yale's assets tied up in things like forestry, private equity, hedge funds. The man's impact is immense. My wife went to Yale um, when she goes on reunions with her friends. They just can't even believe what's happened to the physical stock of the campus. What it, it's it's a vastly richer place, and it shows and it makes a difference. That said, in 2008, he actually needed to borrow money because he was so illiquid uh, that he didn't, wasn't actually able to, to, uh, to you know, that there are a certain amount, proportion of an endowment that has to be paid out each year. And he wasn't able to do that without borrowing. Uh, and a number of other big funds, big endowment funds, found themselves in the same position. Um, I, for conflict of interest reasons, I, I don't invest. I don't do any active investing myself at all. The one, um, the one share, the individual share I have, I, the, my coffee cup is actually a coffee cup for for uh, Lewis Football Club. Where I was I brought up in Lewis, uh, and um, they they have a community share scheme. So I am a shareholder in Lewis FC. If I make a penny out of it, I will be flabbergasted, and I might even be angry with the, the club. But, um, but so anyway, I I, I avoid doing all doing those investments and i think that's necessary uh, i do sit pro bono on the uh, investment committee of uh the endowment of my old college um and that has been a fascinating experience it's a very useful experience and one of the things is that it's taught me the importance of liquidity even if you are a 700 year old oxford college wanting to make investments for the very long-term future, um, you do actually need to be able to get at the money and to be confident that you can get at the money. And um, 
actually looking at the terms under which you can get into some of these longer term investments at an institutional level. It's quite useful for me that I, I get to see how the investment banks pitch themselves to potential clients rather than to journalists this, this way. I think it probably is possible to answer the, the, your, uh, your friend's question to mimic 6040, to mimic bonds in a more yeah, in a less liquid way, I'm not sure I want to try doing it. Not with a, not with a, 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 not to the extent of making it a backbone of a portfolio. So that makes me think two two things. One is that when I was at Morgan Stanley many years ago, you know, I helped manage the Magdalen College Oxford portfolio. So we saw, you know, a lot of those sort of you know challenges. Um, uh, but but I guess the real question behind my question on 6040 is in this explosion of private assets and now a return to a more normal cost of capital, if you were sitting there with a clean piece of paper, would you be pretty sceptical about how much you wanted to allocate to that space? Last year was an historically unbelievably bad year for 6040. Uh, it was the kind of year that if you'd looked at the previous 100 years, you would have said it was pretty much impossible for 2022 to happen, for both bonds and stocks to fall as precipitously as they did together. Um, and that even includes 2008, where at least bonds by the end of the year you know, cushioned a little bit of the pain from what happened to stocks. Um, so you know, plainly, there is uh, there are risks in in 6040, you need to go beyond uh, that rigid, uh, rigid way of looking at it. The experience with alternative assets, this is again my probably tending to be too negative or too bearish, but I think the experience so far with alternative assets is actually not that different from classic experience with mutual funds or whatever. There is return chasing. Uh, it looks like it's something much more academic and well-reasoned but in fact hedge funds boomed in the years before the financial crisis because they actually made money in the years that the dot-com bubble was bursting they'd all used their the stock picking hedge funds worked out to pile up on out of fashion stocks and short the heck out of dot-coms and they actually made money during a bear market which was utterly fantastic and meant far more money went into them than they had capacity to manage. And then they stepped on a rake in 2008, when apart from a few very famous uh, examples like John Paulson, most of them lost every bit as much money as you'd have lost in your, your mutual fund. Uh, I think something similar may well be uh, afoot with private equity. Um, uh, it's, it's leverage, after all. Leverage has been ludicrously cheap for a long time. And the industry has done a very good job of allowing, getting itself to be kept as opaque as it possibly can get away with. So uh, again, private equity, you can, you can come up with uh, all these good arguments for why it should work. Uh, and obviously David Swenson exploited that beautifully. Uh, but I think there again, we are seeing return chasing people piling into the sector because it's done well. And that will probably mean that there is more money in there than it can handle and that that will underperform. Um, similarly, yeah, again, having lived through long-term capital management, there are lots of very sure bets in bond markets, but something can go wrong uh, as it did. And it, it was not that implausible an event that Russia reneged on its, you know, it, its domestic debt in 1998, and that was the domino that led to long-term capital management um, melting down. Actually, that's another point. I, that's a point I perhaps should have mentioned in, in 2018. I, th I think the, um, the concept of the black swan has been uh, taken far too far, and uh, any number of things that really aren't black swan events are being dubbed as black swan so people can try to excuse themselves from lo for losing money just be worried about all the rather menacing white swans flapping around and you know, be more careful. Yes. And actually, just before we leave Swenson, I think what is often forgotten is that he did have access to some of the cream of the crop early on who are not 
are not available to many of those who have followed. So there is a skew or a bias that just is, I think, just forgotten in the excitement. There's more to David Swenson than first mover advantage, but first mover advantage is a big part of why Yale did as well as it did for as long as it did. It, 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 he, uh, he also had very good people around him and really interrogated uh, people looking to pitching, pitching for money. And he also had similar to Warren Buffett, actually, in, in, in a way that uh, there came a time when uh, if you were a hedge fund or a private equity guy, you wanted Swenson to give you some money because that would look so good and help you raise money from others. So they would offer him preferential terms in the same way that Buffett can uh, often get preferential financing terms in the deals he makes because of his role. It, it's just well done. The man, even if his ideas weren't perfect, was something close to a genius. You and I can't do that at home. Correct. So every day or nearly every day, you are authoring really, I mean, typically very interesting, insightful stuff that has people reading your column and your team's work. Tell me a little bit, how do you go about finding the stories you want to cover? A big part in the morning is about subjecting yourself to the fire hose uh, of of information that's out there and trying to survey the uh, survey the territory as quickly as you can lots of people send me email i flick through that anxiously as quickly as i can and i try to see if any patterns are emerging i think the bloomberg terminal not wanting to sound like i'm uh, you know plugging my my employer the Bloomberg terminal is a very, very useful equalizer. So I can quickly go through seeing where different markets have reached. I can see things that are sticking out and follow that a little while and quickly see if there's a clear explanation. Oh my God, what can possibly be moving that stock in that direction? Ah, oh, it went to dividends. Forget that. But you can, you can use the terminal to, uh, to uh, scout that way very quickly. I talk to a lot of people, but I have I know who I trust, basically from years of getting to know people and having an idea who is honest and who is smart. I'm very lucky at the moment. I have you know, Isabel Lee uh, is my current partner in crime, uh, one of the cross-asset team reporters at, the, uh, at Bloomberg. Um, you know, she's, she's a Filipina. She's getting up 30 years younger than me. She has a very different perspective. She talks to different people. Uh, and that has been very useful for me, that, that uh, uh, she will tend, that helps ensure that I don't become too dependent on the same people with the same group think. Um, when it comes to really deciding what I'm going to say, again, one rule of thumb, and this is before I started to believe it, was, um, at the FT was, if you're going to explain something, you have to explain it in your own words. You have to be able to uh, get at why this matters and explain it for yourself. So if somebody spins you a tale or you read, you know, somebody has a note that's very interesting. If after about 10 minutes sitting in front of a Bloomberg screen, I can replicate it, I'm confident that a, this isn't just data mining, and B, I understand how it works, and then I can move forward. If somebody spins me a story and uh, you know I, I put in all the the relevant, apparently the relevant data into the terminal, and I just can't get get the picture to look anything like what was spun to me. Either it's too highfalutin or it's it's dishonest, but either way, I don't understand it, and so I'd better not write that, so I'd better not follow that. Um, I do think one of the secrets to my success such as it is, is that um, I do try always to start from the principle of, do I understand this? How do I explain this from first principles using logic? And I think when you have the confidence to do that, it does become a lot clearer to people out there. So, so um, that's, that would be the final stage of, of making a decision. And then obviously sometimes, sometimes 
huge things are going on in the market and you know that you're not really going to be doing deep analysis. You're just going to be doing your best to explain what just happened. And sometimes it's actually more interesting when there isn't all that much happening on the market. Then you can try to have fun, dig deep, ask where you want to rove the spotlight to. And how do you judge when you've got it wrong? Which is quite a lot of the time. Um, wrong in the sense of making a prediction that is that is completely negated. I mean, that, that will basically happen with the wisdom of time. If I've actually made a factual mistake, I will know about it very soon because I've got you know, over 100,000 subscribers who get it in their inbox, email inbox in the morning, most of whom pretty well inform themselves. So if I've said yields when I meant prices, I will know about it. And, it, and it's slipped through the editors, which it's unlikely to do. But when, as inevitably happens, you make some kind of silly absent-minded mistake like that, I will know about it very soon. Unlike with Lex, where you're actually criticizing companies and you really did have to worry about, you know, legal matters, you know, they will, they have the money and they have the incentive and they will try to sue you if they possibly can. The field in which I'm writing, at least I don't need to worry about um, litigiousness. The other area that, that is a new feature in, in journalistic life since, since I've been involved is the online niche mob, which is much more aggressive than it used to be. Um, one of the big benefits of moving from the FT to, to Bloomberg was that I took my FT following with me, and then I've added a lot more via Bloomberg. So th th there's a lot of people out there. Um, comments below the line, Twitter, now known as X, et cetera, et cetera. If you say something that's people dislike. Um, I was a skeptic about GameStop and I got you know, immense amounts of abuse about that. If you're skeptical about crypto, but also from a different generation, if you're skeptical about gold and silver in particular, um, uh, those have come to have sort of almost cultural political significance. So when you're writing about those particular subjects, you're generally very well aware of how much aggression is out there and it does make you tread carefully. I hope it doesn't make me avoid crypto or gold or meme stocks or whatever, but, but um, you do know that if you get something wrong on one of those topics, you're going to know about it. And my skin is reasonably thick and my columns are my columns rather than me but no i do not like being slagged off on social media no it is anybody else it's something you do want to avoid let's just talk about financial innovation you and i have been patrolling the streets of finance for long enough to have seen lots of things um uh all you know shiny shiny new attractive at various points in time and it was the late Paul Volcker's aphorism, wasn't it, that the greatest development he'd seen in finance was the cash machine. <laughs> so in terms of innovation, have you actually seen anything that you would say, well, that's really helped our world? Now, amazingly, I was going to give you that exact um, anecdote. Uh, he didn't say it was the best. He said it was the only innovation <laughs> that has been finance in his career. So just to, uh, that's, that's how Luddite curmudgeonly Paul Volcker was. In terms of innovation, again, I have issues with it, um, but I do think index investing, particularly as Jack Bogle, another one of the, you know, the tr you just mentioned Paul Volcker, then we get onto Jack Bogle, They're another one of the phalanx of really great people that I was very privileged to meet while they were alive. I do think that the, the index fund has made a great deal of difference. It's meant that a lot of uh, a, a lot of people spend less money on, on fees. It's uh, shaken up the active investment world. It's, it, it is, uh, that is a great idea. It's not a flawless idea. Um, in terms of other innovations that have really made a difference, it's interesting how many things end up being the same as the last idea. Um, I guess it's trouble with this, but I don't care. I, I, I am a free marketeer. I, you know, I'm 
care about liberty more than I do about most things. But I do think you should save people from shysters out there who are trying to rip them off because there are a lot of people out there trying to rip people off. But one of my first stories, one of the big stories at the FT was um, the personal pension scandal, um, you know, late era Thatcher reform, um, where people were just missold outrageously, if you remember, firefighters, miners, leaving copper bottom final salary schemes for very heavy, charge heavy um, index linked stuff. It was terrible. Um, and uh, I do think, therefore, some degree of paternalism, some degree of helping people's helping people through the wilderness does make a lot of sense. I, I guess the innovation I really think would make a difference and people are trying to come up with it, but it's still not going to be good, is to replicate the defined benefit pension plan without actually paying for the guarantees, coming up with something that is close enough to what it offers and the way it behaves through a DB plan that people can treat it the same way. Such plans are very healthy for the for the body politic and for the economy, and they allow for a much longer term thinking and if they work that well they also release a lot of people from financial fear um and you know target dating funds aren't the answer but they're an attempt at it and so on and a lot of the interesting portfolio ideas around improving on 60 40 and similarly trying to get at that that idea but that that is the innovation i would like to see um but in general no i i, I suppose we could also talk about esg which is a whole another thing which is a fascinating development, but uh, I, I'm not sure it's an innovation that has really been as, uh, as as positive for humanity as the ATM. So you've written extensively on ESG, so I'm going to think I'm going to let our listeners and read watchers go to some of your very good articles that I have read in ahead of this meeting, which, you know, talk about, you know, what, we'll get un, under the bonnet very well. If you were to, if you were to offer one sentence on your view of ESG, what might it be? One sentence on ESG is there is no particular reason why you shouldn't invest on the basis or taking into account environmental, social and governance factors. And opposition to it is extremely um, overdone. But the positive impact that ESG can have is greatly exaggerated and a lot of any attempts to really do any good with ESG have been vitiated by the way it has been used to try to save uh, the fund management industry. Sure, that's very good. That's one long sentence with seven commas, but very good. <laughs> now, culture, you have been one of not that many people to have worked uh, in the UK and therefore seen Europe up, up close. You're in the US, so you're right there in the thick of it. I mean, there's a lot of criticism that's directed at Europe and the UK, because I'm sitting in the UK, more of it. Peter Harrison, who's been a guest on the show, CEO of Schroeder's, quoted in the Sunday Times the other day saying, the UK has become a socialist country with a capitalist system. Um, and Emily Holer, who is political editor of Money Week, had a question, um, which is, what do you think can be done to reverse London's decline? London's decline as a financial centre. Yes, and I'm going to just I'm going to add my own in parenthesis, which is, is it actually just being over egged because the US has been in a turbocharged super boom, and so these things are cyclical and have a way of sorting themselves out? Close bracket. On culture, I, I mean, I, I go back far enough. I, uh, Margaret Thatcher was still running the UK when I started the FT, so yes, I, I've, I've seen a fair amount of different things. Does Europe deserve all its criticism? I get more pragmatic and practical about this as time goes by. Uh, you yourself specialized in economic histories. There are more than, there's more than one good way to run an economy, and there is no perfect way. The post-war welfare state corporate consensus worked brilliantly in Germany and to a lesser extent the other continental European countries for you know, three, four decades, and then it ran out of puff. The Thatcher-Reagan much more, much more libertarian approach worked brilliantly for two or three decades and then ran out of puff. And we're searching around for another model that will work 
reasonably well. Um, but plainly, the uh, you know the German corporatist model is not functioning very well, and you know the mere fact that there's a real chance people are going to vote for Donald Trump to come back as president next year in this country wouldn't be possible unless people are very, very unhappy with the way the economy is going here, even though the US has been the home to some you know, remarkable innovation over the last quarter of a century. And even though its stock market is uh, more dominant than ever over the rest of the world. Now, in terms of London coming back as a as a centre. I think the decline of London can be overstated because its previous ascent was overstated. This was one of the things I was, you know, at the FT, I was, you know, I was based in New York, but you know, I'd come back three or four times a year. And in the run up to the crisis, 2006, 7, 8, people in London thought London had overtaken New York um, and would talk smugly about that, how I was usefully coming to London to catch up with what was really going on, you know, to, to the heart of things, which was a tad concerning right there. And it was very noticeable that in the US from early 07 onwards, everybody knew there was a crisis on. Didn't know how bad it was going to be, didn't know which banks were going to go bust, all that, but everybody knew there was a crisis. Bulls would admit that this was a serious credit issue that was going to, that was a huge challenge to the economy. Um, and it would dominate conversations. And London, there was no sense at all that things were in any way difficult. I, I, it was quite bizarre. It was like I was going two years back in time, uh, or as though these people just weren't plugged in adequately. Yeah, you know, I can remember all the suggestions that there should be statues of Sarbanes and Oxley outside the London Stock Exchange to uh, to commemorate their their role in forcing people away from the US. Uh, excitement about the AIM market, which basically never made money for anybody other than the people launching companies in it. Yeah, you know, the the rise of London was overstated in the first place, and plainly in part owed to um, the Eurozone and the, the Euro, that it was this very handy place that was, on, that, that was available for that, that you could uh, trade with Europe very easily without actually being in the Eurozone. Um, so in terms of bringing it back, note that it is still almost as dominant over foreign exchange trading as it's ever been, and that's a big deal. And that's the one big area which is a problem being based here in New York, or that, that, that uh, the real genius, the real hardcore of setting um, of, of foreign exchange uh, happens on London hours in London for the most part. That advantage hasn't been lost. In terms of the stock market, that, that went away a long time ago. And it ain't coming back in terms of other elements of the financial system, though. Um, you do have the great advantage that there is such a big pool of skilled labor already there. Uh, and there is still no clear one place to move to in continental Europe. Um, I've often wondered why Amsterdam isn't building business better. Everybody there speaks English anyway. It's a pleasant place to live. Paris has its issues, people don't want to move to Frankfurt, etc. Dublin is too small. Um, you know, the, there is no one place that is attracting attention away. 30 odd years ago when I joined the PFT, there was a lot of discussion about London versus Frankfurt. Hard to imagine now. That was that was a huge thing. The, the enemy almost was Frankfurt, and the FT was very proud that it had a Frankfurt edition. That was our first foray outside of London had just launched when I arrived. There isn't any one single European centre. Um, so I, I, I don't think London boomed as much as it thought it did. And I don't think it has declined or will decline as far as people believe it has. And finally, you know, I'm still the person who worked for the Financial Times for 29 years. Brexit probably wasn't a great idea. Uh, and reversing it would probably help London's status as a financial centre 
I can't bear to see the country go through what it would require to agree to rejoin the EU. So I'm not necessarily proposing that. But yeah, if you if you there are a lot of people who bemoan the decline of London who voted for Brexit, and I don't have much sympathy for them. Now. I don't. I, I think the status of Brexit, the, the importance of Brexit, can be hugely overstated, and it is in both directions all the time. But plainly at the margin, if you care about London's status as a financial centre, it would have been better to stay in the EU. Like, anybody who argues otherwise, it's just silly. That, that, that would have helped. And actually, I was reading a, what I think is a really terrific book written by, I think they're both ex Bloomberg, or maybe still are, um, commentators, which is The World for Sale, about the world of oh, commodities right. and yes. commodities. I think it is a brilliant read. And I just wondered to myself whether the rebuild of Ukraine, the ongoing redevelopment and development of the world, isn't going to make the super cycling commodities lying ahead quite interesting as an investor, but also who's, where does, where, where do the metals trading sit? And, you know, it isn't in Frankfurt, is it? It's in, you know, a lot of it's in London. It's, so, it's in the LME still, yes. So. And um, although what happened with nickel last year, that's the kind of thing you perhaps want to address if you want to Keep up. No, that's Javier Blas and Jack Farchi wrote that, that book, both of whom were colleagues at the FT and both of whom preceded me moving on to Bloomberg. That is brilliant. Uh, Javier built up his network of contacts with the, the commodities trading business while he was still at the FT. Uh, I actually went to one of the conferences that the FT ran on, uh, on commodity trading. Um, and it's extraordinary. There are these vastly powerful people who nobody ever hears of and who nobody ever writes about. Uh, and, and it was uh, really frightening just to think this is what's going on in the world and I know nothing about it. Um, and um, well, yeah, when I was head of Lex, I, will, I, I spoke to a nameless mining executive. You know, when you do these interviews, you have a PR person at the side. Um, and he gave me anecdotes about various Latin American dictators he'd done deals with to build a railway to his mine. Um, very Machiavellian, off the record, unfortunately. And then when I asked about another form of money, he said, well, that's, that's never been profitable. The only time we ever made money was in South Africa, and that was only because we had slave labor there. And, and the, uh, the uh, PR guy didn't look terribly happy that he had just said that to the head of Lex. Um, but it was off the record, so I'm not telling you who that was. Um, and there are, believe me, there are quite a number, of, a number of people in the commodities business who might have said such a thing. Uh, but anyway, getting onto the world of commodity cycles, yes, that, that's one of the things that I've come to understand better and better as years have gone by, how important that is. Um, just because it's not directly analogous to China in the, to, to, sorry, to, 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 to OPEC in the 1970s. That told us something, what happened to the world in the, in the 70s. And certainly you can make a very interesting argument that the world is going to grow a lot because of the move towards battery technology, electric vehicles, anti-climate change, it's a big issue and political issue in this country. Most of the rest of the world thinks they have to get on with it. Um, that's going to lead to some very interesting issues with a very odd array of countries that control uh, the supply of some of those some of those new vital commodities that weren't vital before, cobalt and lithium and manganese. So yes, I agree that that's a fascinating topic, and I do think there is every chance that we do have another commodity super cycle taking shape, which is probably good for the emerging world at the margin and not so great for the, for the stock market and for the US uh, relative to the rest. John, I've got a few closing questions, which are, uh, first of all, we rate you, people rate you, you have 100,000 people reading your things every day. Who do you rate? Who do you go to as almost, if you were only going to be reading two or three people, who would it be either reading or listening? Jason Zweig of the Wall Street Journal is probably my biggest competitor. He writes The Intelligent Investor, which is a, a take on Benjamin Graham's. Yes. I have, I, I like the guy immensely. I've sort of been bumping into him for 25 years. Um, I have total respect for the man. Um, he's very, very good, very, very calm. Came up with one line that I ended up having to 
copying, which is um, because I couldn't improve on it. That was uh, his job proffering investment advice was basically to write the same thing 50 or 100 times a year and hope the editors didn't realize. And, and, and to some extent, that's true, that, that, that uh, there, really, it, there really is a simple core of things that a responsible uh, investment writer needs to get across. Um, he no, he's now switched to management as Bartleby at The Economist, but Philip Coggan was probably the single most important mentor in my years at the FT, uh, and I succeeded in writing The Long View. He was Buttonwood, and now he's Bartleby, and uh, you know, I would always trust him. The other critical uh, mentor who I would always trust is uh, Martin Wolf, who has been through a fascinating intellectual journey over the years I've known him. And he has moved, he's had the, the courage and the decency to, uh, to change his mind and admit that he's changed his mind. Um, he was, now he's sort of almost, people treat him as though he's a, a, a London version of Paul Krugman. Um, and he certainly wasn't always that, um, uh, but he often would talk to me, uh, to sound off ideas. Um, and that was really a privilege. He, he came across as very opinionated. I was a little scared of him at first. Um, but in fact, he's a very human person who does learn from experience. So that those, uh, and, and then finally my, my, obviously everybody who works for Bloomberg Opinion. And Rob Armstrong, who I actually hired to write for Lex, who took over my old newsletter at the FT, um, and he is a brilliant guy. That's my list of people you should you should read or follow. Fantastic. Now, if you were comparing the culture at the FT and the culture at Bloomberg, what might be either the one word you described uh, about each of them or the difference between each of them? They're actually much more diff much more similar than I would have thought. So just for context, Bloomberg News started a few months after I started at the FT, at a point when the FT had just celebrated its centenary. The thing they have in common is that they're genuinely global and that they are very much more anxious to get things right than to make any particular point, basically because both of them are totally dependent on people trusting them. Um, when you get I'm not going to talk about this in great detail, but when you get issues like the FT on Brexit or Bloomberg with Michael Bloomberg's presidential candidacy, that, that is difficult for them simply because people really, it, it is important to be seen to be honest and impartial. That doesn't mean both sides. It means honest and clear and accurate. And it's fascinating how similar they both are. It's also fascinating how global they are. So there's a lot of Americans at the FT, lots of it's a very, very multinational place. Bloomberg is an extraordinarily global multinational place. Um, if there is a difference between them, uh, and one which makes Bloomberg much more, much more, uh, I'll, I'll never say a bad word about the FT, but, but uh, they, they kept me very happy employed for 29 years. Um, the thing that Bloomberg does have is scale and it's well enough managed to use that scale. So the number, the sheer number of reporters who are well versed at Bloomberg um, is incredible. In the FT, it was about being very, very, you know, a, a, a small group of, I hope, very good people, and it's still very good people because it's still a good product, doing their best to, by their smarts to stay ahead. In Bloomberg, there is this massive resource, this massive reporting machine that I can access. I'm still after five years learning how best to access it. The sheer number of Bloomberg journalists who have CFA qualifications and MBAs is, is quite remarkable. So there are far more people, again, because of scale, ultimately because of business, a business model that is working better at the moment than the business model of a legacy newspaper is, is working. But um, there are far more people at Bloomberg who'd actually look me in the eye and tell me I'm wrong, which after you've 
written the Longview column and been the Lex, you know, headed Lex, the FT, the number of people who are going to tell you you're wrong is beginning to get smaller. Um, there's plenty of people at Bloomberg who will tell me I'm wrong. Um, and that's very useful. So that's, I think at this point, the big difference between those two organizations is, um, is scale and the uh, ability to use it. That, that was what was most appealing was that this was the kind of resource that really helped me cover markets. And, and um, you know, I will never regret the wonderful years I spent at the FT learning how to be a journalist, but it's been fantastic putting that to work somewhere else. Great. The last two questions, John, you've met lots of people on your travels. Who haven't you met yet that you would like to sit down and eat with? In terms of people I really have not met at all, they, they really aren't. I've been, in a, I, I've been lucky. I suppose he's still around and he's a very entertaining guy. And it's possible quite a lot of readers won't, or listeners won't recognize the name of Peter Lynch who was the face of fidelity, the face of classic mutual fund active management uh, at a point when it was possible to make much more money that way than it is now uh, and grew Magellan Fund to be the first $100 billion fund. The success he had cannot be, you know, cannot be argued away. He was, something he was doing was quite brilliant and he got out when he was ahead. He's an interesting guy who I, I think I might, I think I, there was one press conference where he said a few words, but I've never actually sat down and talked to Peter Lynch. And I'm not sure it's possible to do investing the way he did it and make money anymore. It might still be a very good way for an individual with time on their hands to try to manage money. Um, so maybe Peter Lynch. He was the man, of course, who said that the most important day of the week for a portfolio manager was Saturday, because then you went out and you asked retailers and people working how their business was. And that was where discovery really happened. It was fascinating the way, the way he approached things. He looked for ideas in the real world and then looked for investment opportunities to help him make money from what he was seeing. And, and, and that, which is nowadays known as thematic investing, and you can get 100 stocks and they will find ways to you know, there'll, there'll be correlation swaps to help you benefit from this theme or whatever. Back in his day, he just owned stocks. And uh, yes, the other the other thing he said, which is one of the, I think was one of the points I did make in my uh, 2018 farewell note from the long view is know what you know. Know what you own and know why you own it. Um, and I expanded that slightly to know what you know and know what you don't know. Um, but, you know, if you don't know why you are holding on to something, what are you up to? And I think that feeds to one of the biggest issues with the way passive investing and benchmarking have affected markets in that 30 odd years ago, people would say they owned a stock or they didn't. Now, because they are benchmarked so tightly against the market, the index, they'll say they're overweight or underweight something. And then that leads to the utter absurdity that if you're underweight, say you're, 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 if you're foot, if you're linked to the FTSE, then BP and FTSE, then Shell is something like 7% each of the FTSE, whatever the number is, a huge number. If you basically don't think BP is a very good company and you don't want to own it, you're still highly unlikely to just not have any of it at all. You're going to be underweight. So you're in the weird situation where because you bet against it by being underweight, you want this stock that you own to do badly. That is the kind of problem that, you know, Peter Lynch, straightforward, active investing, you know, long only, didn't run into. So, John, the final question, I opened with this fact that you are a classical singer, you performed on stage with some greats. What does singing give you? Singing in a choir um, is this wonderful sense of coming together with so many people to make something that is greater, the sum is greater, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, particularly when it comes to being in a, you know, playing in an orchestra in a large concert hall, um, uh, classical music is much more exciting than people think it is. Uh, and it's certainly very exciting when you're in the choir 
right behind the timpanis and the brass and watching the conductor make this whole, you know, these hundreds of people in front of him act as one. So that's very exciting. Uh, singing solo, which I don't do that much, but again, it's personal, it's fun. There's this sense of connecting to, to people. There is, uh, I think there is a natural human urge. If you go to a football ground, you'll see it easy enough to burst into song. You could also argue there's a natural human urge to dance. I'm a terrible dancer. I'm a pretty good singer. But you know, the, the, this sense of wanting to release, of, of uh, getting the heart of what's going on inside you out, out there and sharing it is, is, a, is a deep human emotion and one that uh, I, yeah, I enjoy greatly. So I, I suppose the other thing, I, I'm not good at sports, never have been. Um, I've been very lucky. I've had a, I was, yeah, I, I, I happen to have a pretty good voice. Feels good to, to do something that's different from the rest of what I do that's, that's not intellectual, but that allows real expression. And uh, yes, if you, uh, anyone out there wants to try singing, you, you may or may not be lucky enough to have a good enough voice to, to get as far as I, as I did singing, um, but it's, yeah, it's it's fun, and uh, I think everybody needs something like that in their lives. John, you've got a obviously a great voice, but you've had a great brain and pen, and you have provided uh, investors and other followers of the markets with insights for a long, long time. So keep doing it. You're your your piece for those listeners who haven't points of opinion is really really good and um i've been taking it long before we ever connected so thank you for coming today i normally summarize some of the you know the the salient points that i i am um, i've tried to absorb i've written down quite a lot but i'll just take two one is that if anybody is listening or knows somebody thinking about journalism Go cut your teeth in emerging markets because there are the information dislocations, or as you said, you can't rely on the institutions to work as well. So I thought that was very good advice. Um, And back all the way to a, a, a recent point, which is as we think about our portfolios, what do you own and why do you own it? Dot, dot, dot. So... John, thank you for joining us today and good luck in the future. And uh, it's been great chatting. Thank you. Thanks for having me.